We arranged, as you can see, we arranged some rain there just to keep the dust down, which was kind of helpful. I think everybody having a good time at Ballybaloo? Yeah. At the Lit Fest? <laughs> good. I'm having a great time myself. I even had that, you know that, you know that moment when somebody says, I'll meet you in the car park? No. Come alone? <laughs> it's in the boot of the car. You know, and you think, yes! The white stuff. <laughs> and you go along, and they open up the boot, and there it is. The white stuff. You're going to have to elaborate on that. Milk kefir grains. <laughs> yes! The wolf of Litfest. <laughs> so I hope you all have a magical experience in the car park, meeting your man and or woman. <laughs> It's great. Now, I am, it's my honor. My name is John McKenna. I'm a food writer. I've been writing about Irish food for the best part of 30 years. Uh, As my fourth year here being at Litfest. I am delighted to introduce one of the great European writers, who is Elizabeth Luard. So let's give Elizabeth a big welcome. <laughs> now, we are going to talk about the sacred in food, but I want, first of all, just to ask you, You've lived all around the world. You're presently living in the Cambrians in, in Wales. Yes, view, view of the mountains, the Cambrian mountains. It rains, um, never rains <laughs> in Ireland, always <laughs> rains in Wales, what can I say? And um, I can't really see anything. In the winter, I can see a house, but that's it. Wow. So, Do you like remoteness? I don't know. I sort of tend to go where I get put. To. Right. And for some reason, that's where I got put. <laughs> and uh, I've been there for 25 years, so obviously I'm not... Only a bit of a wanderer, but when I was in my youth, my misspent youth and my well-spent youth and the middle bit, I um, did a lot of traveling. I took mm -hmm. my children to live in Andalusia. Andalusia, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And then took them into to France, to the longer docks, so that they could add French to their Spanish. So yes, there's been quite a lot of traveling in my life. Is that featured in the new book, Squirrel Pie? Uh, yes. Uh, it's called Squirrel Pie because it's really memorable and slightly shocking, you see. We're not, it's not Squirrel Nut <laughs> Have you made a Squirrel Pie? Yeah, sure, of course. Yeah? I wouldn't write about something I yeah? have Absolutely. Um, okay, it's very quickly. Squirrel. Do you have squirrel. to catch the squirrels first, yes? You get somebody else. Or roadkill is good. Ro roadkill is okay. Yeah. Roadkill. But I can absolutely recommend... Better. Um, roadkill depends which, you know, you, you've got to be careful with roadkill. There are rules, did you know? That about roadkill? About roadkill. I did not. Did anybody know there were roots about ro rules, roadkill? Rules about roadkill. Okay, you, you elaborate. Can't, you can't hit, hit it yourself with your vehicle. <laughs> you have to travel around the roads and you have to have a pickup car behind you or walker or whatever. Uh-huh. And because it's illegal to pick up your own roadkill. I mean, how batty is that? Illegal? It's illegal in, in the UK. Actually I don't illegal. know about in Ireland. Yeah. So there is, there, is, there is a statute on the, on the yeah, books. Yeah, it says you can't pick up roadkill. But somebody coming behind somebody you... Somebody coming behind you can pick can up roadkill. Pick road up road yep. Wow. Strange. Amazing. Well, it makes for good company, doesn't right, it? Right, it certainly <laughs> does, yeah. So you've got your grey squirrel, which yeah. somebody else obligingly has bumped with their... Land yeah. Rover, and you come along and say, gosh, I'm starving. No, no, you, you're in the first car, so you you're know it's car. nice and fresh. Right, Or okay. you've got a friend. Yeah. Most, I mean, squirrel pie was... Uh, the, the story behind it is that we have so many grey squirrels in the UK. Yes, are too many. I don't know if there are many in Ireland, are there? Yes, there okay. are, yeah. And yeah. the grey squirrels... County are basically, Kilkenny, unbelievable. ...basically pushed out the red. Yep. For one really good reason, which is that the... Well, the grey are bigger, and they don't hibernate. So they're ah. on the move all winter. Right. So they right. basically um, eat everything out. Right. So we and should be eating them. We should be eating them. Right. Of course we should. Right. I mean, you know, the whole principle about living in a landscape is that it has to relate to what, well, in my view, it has to relate to what you put on the table. Yeah. Because if it doesn't, um, your pick and mix diet business, <laughs> which I was ranting about this morning in the garden tent, um, but if you live like that, it doesn't mean that you don't have trade routes or you can't move outside your own, uh -huh. um, your own tradition, because you can. If you go to a, I don't know, in the longer dock, if you go to, let's say, Ravel or Castel Norahi, um, they're not, the people living there, they only eat local food right. on market day when, you know, you finish selling your goods and then you go off and have, there's an, always a little restaurant that opens mm -hmm. on market day or no other day. 
And um, if you're going to go out for a meal, you're going to go to Chinese or Thai or right. something. You're not actually going to go to a French one, which means that um, anybody from outside looking for local food, they'll probably only get it on Market right. Day. Right. Otherwise, they're stuck with the local Chinese and wonder why on earth this is happening. <laughs> So anyway, um, for the grey squirrel, I went to Land of Origin, which was Maine, um, because uh, as a food writer, you go, you go with other food writers yeah. and you make friends along the way. And um, I think I was in Barcelona, where there was some people from Maine, um, George Semler and Lucy, and they live in Maine most of the year, but she teaches Catalan in school. Uh -huh. George um, takes people on walks around Barcelona. And he was cross and stroppy. <laughs> because basically, um, what happens to food writers is that the food people don't usually have money, mm -hmm. but the wine people do. Yes. So you're <laughs> always, sometime in the springtime, when nothing is happening in the wineries, staring at lines of bottles going round and round <laughs> and round and round. So he was sort of generally fed up with this. And I like people who are looking generally fed up over there, because they're usually quite mm. interesting. Uh -huh. So became friends, and then I decided that I wanted to go and trample through the wild woods of Maine, right. as you do. Yep. So I was over there. My son married an American girl, lives in New York, two American grandchildren, good reason. Then I go up to Maine and um, it's called, you're a bird dog. Basically, you're a pickup. Uh -huh. And I said, um, George, I want to, you know, come out with you and see what happens. Because the woods of Maine are quite unlike the woods anywhere else in Europe. They are thick. Nobody cuts them. They're full of, um, well, obviously birds and you get the blueberry barrens. It's spectacular in the autumn. Yeah. So I went out with the hunters, and I said to George, what about some squirrel? Because I was, you know, was interested. There are classic recipes for squirrel. You can stop me if I'm going on too no, long. No, great. I want to know how do you make a squirrel pie. <laughs> squirrel pie. Well, you get your... Yeah, he had two roadkill and a couple more. And um, he was a good shot. It's very important <laughs> to go out with a good shot. Uh -huh. And then you've got to trample through the woods, and then you have to take it home, and then you skin the squirrels. Squirrel is quite small. It's a member of the rat family, uh -huh. so everybody says, yuck, you can't eat squirrel. Can't eat it. Yeah, but the flavor of squirrel meat is, it's like quite young rabbit, and much more, yes. it's tender. Have you eaten it yourself? I have not, no. Well, it's no. on various um, smart right. menus. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so it's not entirely unknown. And then you bung it all in a pot, along with a de-feathered duck, <laughs> and maybe a bit of wood grouse, uh -huh. Uh -huh. stick it in the oven, and on it goes. Right, fantastic. And then you have to make it into a pie. Does anybody know about pot pie? Any Americans, pot pie? Yeah, you see pot, two Americans at the back. You <laughs> see, you do know, exactly. Um, the pot pie, it took me a lot of finding out uh -huh. to find out what, why Americans recognize pot pie and we don't seem to recognize pot pie, chicken pot pie. It's basically, you put the lid of the pastry on top of the pot in which the squirrel, or whatever it is, chicken, something, has been cooked. Uh -huh. Bung it in the oven, because the early settlers, they had plenty of wood, they yes. all had ovens, they baked bread. Yes. So it's called a pot pie. Pie. There we go. Lovely. That's it. Fantastic. <laughs> okay, I have to try that in the future. Now listen, we're going to talk about the sacred in food, which was the subject of your book back in 2001. That's right. And, yeah. and when I was doing a little bit of reading about this, what I, I came across was uh, in, in one of Michael Pollan's books, uh, in ancient Greece, the word for cook, butcher, and priest was the same. It's the word magiros. And the word mm. shares an etymological root with magic. Mm. So the priest, the cook, and the butcher are all the same. I have can we, under, have we yes. anything like that now? Does anything like that survive? I was sort of looking much more at the anthropological, that if you look at Claude Levi Strauss, who I'm yep. sure is familiar to the entire audience. The raw um, and the cooked. Basically the father of anthropology, modern mm. anthropology. And he was studying the Cree Indians in Canada. And he described the act of worship by the Cree Indians as the raising of 
a bowl of berries. Um, a bowl of berries, green berries, and you first offer them to the earth, to the water, and then to the sun. So you're asking for heat, warmth, and ripeness. Mm -hmm. So the idea of sweetness in food, of ripeness in food, is hugely important because at that point, you know, all life comes from the sun. Yes. That is the thinking behind it. So it is not very surprising that northerners such as ourselves with short growing seasons, we have a craving for the flavors of the sun. Yes. So we go for sugar, we go for honey, we go for, you know, maple syrup, whatever it mm -hmm. might be, because that is the taste of life itself. So the sacredness of food is, you know, it's kind of built into it. Mm -hmm. And you get the cooking in there because you are trying to sweeten it. Yes. And the growing, which is the, the water and the earth. And that is pretty much the most primitive gesture of worship right. Right. that you could ever imagine. Otherwise, um, sacrificial animals, yes. you know, which we're talking about the Greeks, um, basic blood on the ground and you eat the meat. It's not that you're suddenly wasting and throwing out food. You're, you know, you're sanctifying what you're eating. With the blood of the animal? The blood, the blood's the blood for the, the gods. Lamb. The blood, for the, yes, that, that's for the gods. Or sometimes it's just the smoke from, right. the, from the cooking fire. Right. It's, um, so it's, it's kind of hot wired into us, which is why we all go and look at the barbecue and we smell it. You know, yeah. I, I was frantically trying to get in the queue for the barbecue a bit earlier. <laughs> and... Um, there was a queue right in the rain yep. and lots of rain falling down all the way. And I thought, well, I'm never going to make it into here if I actually go and queue for the barbecue. Right. But the, that is, you know, it's a sensory experience yes. that's atavistic, atavistic yes. cave mouth stuff, much more attractive. <laughs> and that, that, the, you know, that burning meat. Mm -hmm. I yeah. asked a friend of mine who was a poet who um, translated Homer, Christopher Logue, Got the horse famous, famous yeah, translator friend, and poet. Exactly. Yes. And I rang him up and said, is there any food in Homer? Yeah. And um, he, said, he said, no, except for the, the, the sacrificial element of it. Right. So the idea that meat was for warriors uh, is all bound up. And the blood, but the blood was for the gods. The, the blood was for the gods. But yeah. I wonder what it says about the Irish then, that when we killed the pig, yeah. the idea was not to spill a drop of blood. Because, because that was going to make your blood pudding. Blood pudding. Lots of Is people that proof for really pudding. pagan? What do you think? I think that the pig wasn't a problem. I mean, it probably is quite late into Ireland, right. I think. So right. we're, not, we're going back a bit further. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but did you find these um, sacred and ritual elements? I mean, when you were doing your research and traveling, are they, are they a global phenomenon? I mean, you mentioned there about we northerners crave sweetness. Yeah. But it, you know, in the southern hemisphere, what... what, what well, the middle, the middle bit, I mean, the, the antipodes are kind of, that's, you know, it's a different, different tradition, really, sort of like southern African and the, um, the original inhabitants of, of Australia. You wouldn't, they wouldn't have that kind of, it, Well, they do, it's meat. Yeah. You know, um, the whole... M most of our festivals have to do with seasonality. Yeah. So I did a lot of reading before I did that book, before I wrote that book. Um, not really in cookery books, but in travel books yeah. and anthropology, and because I really like things I know nothing about. <laughs> <laughs> Seems much more interesting than the things I do know something yes, about. Yes. You think? And um, so, and the sacred food, I didn't really need to do traveling. I really need to do an awful lot of reading, reading. Yeah. and then make connections. And I couldn't understand why, when I got to the tropics, you know, the Cancer, mm -hmm. Cancer and Capricorn, Capricorn yeah. in Ecuador, that the, the didn't seem to be seasonal until it suddenly occurred to me it wasn't um, hot and cold, it was wet and dry. Wet and dry. Yes. So the seasons were not very important. Right. They were just, you know, they weren't really part of the ritual. Uh -huh. So the European, the European tradition of Christmas being mid midwinter, yes. you know, is very relevant to us and all over Europe, right into Russia, right into the whole northern part. So, um, before I embarked on this book, I thought I'd better find out about some religions. You know, I'd better go and look it up. And people were kind of defining these 
what the differences were in 1900 to 1920. So there's quite a lot of literature around that time. And so I started with A, which was Amish, perhaps? Yes. It could have been a bit yeah. earlier. Yeah. And I went all the way through. And I finally got to Zoroaster. And yes. I thought... Whose best known practitioner, of course, was... The sun. Freddie Mercury of Queen. Oh, indeed. So, yes, exactly. Yeah. But the thing about Zoroaster is the worship of the sun. Yes. As you know, as everybody here knows. And I thought, I can't be bothered. I've done everybody else, you know, all the bits in between. I, oh, I can't be starting on Zoroaster. But the point about it is that that is the base religion. Yes. You know, that is the root of everything. Because it's, it's heat, and it's what happens when you raise unripe berries. You might actually get ripe berries when you bring it down. That's right. what you want. Right. So it's to do with, with that, with the but, food source. But how was the sacred used then in the, the Hebrew tradition and so on to create rules? The rules about what you can mix with what, what you can and can't eat, what you can mix with what, one thing and you can't mix with one thing. What, yes. is, there, is there a sacred element there or is it oh, simply yeah, a no. rule-making element? Um, I think to some extent the rationale comes after the, the reason why you do it. Right. <laughs> so, um, you know, when you say to somebody, you know, why are you planting, you know, that thing with that thing. That thing. Yeah. And actually they know it's because they wouldn't do anything else. Yeah. So they have to make up a story to convince you. Mm -hmm. So you can get all sorts of wonderful stories. And I slightly suspect that that was what happened quite often. Right. Um, with the, uh, with, we were all nomads at one point mm -hmm. and herdsmen. So there are only certain animals we can herd, mm -hmm. which are, we can herd goats, we can herd sheep, we can herd cattle. What we can't herd is a pig. Yep. Yep. So basically, the pig is the sign of a settled peasantry. Yes. Even, in fact, you know, the word of swineherd is, is a misnomer. Has anybody here kept pigs? Or chased one? You can't. <laughs> I can only tell you, you cannot. I did in Spain with my, cause I, with my children. They said, you, it's, you're wasting too much food. You've got to have a pig. And the local pigs... We've got time. We have two more minutes. Two minutes, okay. The local pigs were all Ibericos, you know, the um, Bata Negra, the yes. made into Serrano <clears throat> ham. And there were no other white, big, large white. They uh -huh. came over later. And um, this pig lived in the, in, in, the, um, in, 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 in the sty. And one actually, you had to look after it. The only way it would get out, it would get out quite regularly because it was, it was called piggy. And um, we didn't give it, call it, petty toes or anything sweet like that. And it would come up to the house and it would go round and round the kitchen table chasing the children. And the only <laughs> way you could actually get it, they can give you a nasty nip. Yes, The yes. only way you could get it out was a blue bucket with the food in and then it would follow you. <laughs> Which, it sort of occurred to me that the reason we had Ibericos in the core chorus of Andalusia was because there was seven centuries under Muslim rule and there was no pig eating. Yeah. Because for the very simple reason that nomads can't herd pigs. pigs. So it was a big separation. Yeah. So when the, um, Isabella and Felipe came back in and there was the reconquest, there were masses of the only free-range pigs in the whole of Europe were there in Andalusia. In that forest. Wasn't that fantastic? Amazing, amazing. <laughs> Finally, are we... There's very little that's sacred about our food today? Oh, every single time we have a festival. We know what we have to eat. We get but, really pissed off with our parents when they're overt. not... But we don't make it overt any longer. We're, we're reluctant to acknowledge sacred or religious But we don't have to acknowledge it. It's there. We just need to celebrate the festival. We, we, can, be, we can just say, you know, we, but it's there at the back of our heads all the time. This is a sacrament. You know, mm -hmm. we're sharing food. We have to share food. We share the same food. Yes. We get slightly nervous if... Um, we have to do a nut roast because somebody <laughs> doesn't want their roast turkey or whatever. Yeah. Um, so basically, you know, that's it, it's there. The we sacred don't, still underpins. We don't have to talk about it. Yeah. It's there anyway. Yeah. We don't have to say prayers over it. We don't have to say anything. We just yeah. do it and it's there. Yeah. That's the whole point of it. Whether it's the blossoming of the cherry tree or the birth of Christ, whatever. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. It's, 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 it's heart wired into us. Lovely. Ladies and gentlemen, a big lit fest. Welcome for Elizabeth Noir. Thank you very much.